Order members, uh, we will now resume and it's time uh, for question time. And uh, it's time for questions to the Minister for the Environment. And we will start with listed questions. And uh, questions 2 and 10 have been withdrawn. And I call Declan McAleer. Question 1. The EU emissions trading system has been a cornerstone of the European Union's policy to combat climate change and it is a flagship tool for cost effectively reducing greenhouse gas emissions from major industrial sources across Europe. The review is being undertaken as a result of the agreement on the 2030 framework for climate and energy which contains a revised target for reducing greenhouse gas emissions by at least 40% by 2030. A reformed EU emissions trading scheme remains the main instrument to help achieve that reduction target. But the review also provides an opportunity to address some areas of concern with the existing scheme, most notably the issue of carbon leakage, as well as providing the opportunity to consider a number of ways in which the scheme could better support low carbon innovation across the industrial sectors and modernisation of the energy industry. I believe that the robust and reformed emissions trading system can play a significant part in reducing greenhouse gases at minimum cost and will also contribute towards achieving our programme for government target of a reduction in emissions by 35 per cent by 2025. However, while there are around 1,000 organisations across the UK currently participating in the ETS, there are only 23 participants registered here, so it's vitally important to ensure that the review does not have a detrimental effect on local participants after 2020 when any proposed revisions are to be introduced. My officials are in regular contact with their colleagues in the Department of Energy and Climate Change on the trading system and specifically on this review. They will provide me with advice later this month, following which I will be providing a response on the current consultation on the review of the trading system. I call Declan McAleer. Uh, Mahogad, I thank the Minister for his answer. Can the Minister tell me, has he had any discussions with his uh, southern colleagues under the aegis of the North-South Ministerial Council on this matter? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member for his question and his supplementary on this extremely important and indeed topical uh, matter that climate change knows no borders and it is imperative that I do engage in discussions not solely with our colleagues in the south, our counterparts in the south, which I do on a regular basis, basis but also those uh, in other jurisdictions. Uh, this is something that comes up regularly at North South Ministerial Council meetings. It's something that uh, Alan Kelly, the Minister in the South, is very committed to addressing on a joined up basis, as was his predecessor, uh, Phil Hogan. Uh, it will, I'm sure, be in a prominent place on the agenda of the next NSMC Council meeting in the environmental format also, and I look forward to updating the Assembly on that meeting in due course. I call Alban McGuinness. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. Uh, could I ask the Minister, in relation to climate change in particular, uh, not only should it be on the agenda of the uh, North-South Ministerial Council, as he's pointed out, but also the British-Irish uh, Council as well, and can there be joint efforts taken right across these islands uh, by all the administrations to tackle uh, the whole issue of climate change. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank Mr. McGuinness for his supplementary. Yes, there can be, there should be, and there are uh, joined up approaches to tackling the issue of climate change. While I do have a close working relationship with my counterpart in, in, in the South, a lot of what we do on climate change is in, is in partnership with our uh, partners across the water as well and the Envi Department of Environment and Climate Change. Uh, it is through them, in fact, that we make our representations in Europe and even further afield on this extremely important subject. I call Anna Lou. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Given the fact that DOE is going to be merged with the Department uh, for Agriculture, 
and there has, as the Minister knows, always been a tension between uh, the environment and, and the interest of, of, of farming industry. What steps is he taking to ensure that climate change mitigation is going to, to stay in focus for Northern Ireland? Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank Ms. Lowe, the Chairperson of the Environment Committee, for that question. What I described this, have already today described this topic as important and topical. The fact is that it's going to become even more important as time goes on. With reference to the amalgamation, shall we say, of departments, I believe it's vital that the issue of climate change remains at the forefront of everything we do. And while uh, the member refers to what she perceives as a tension between my own department and our regulatory arm, the NIEA, and the agriculture industry, I think it's safe enough to say that relationships between both sectors have been and hopefully will continue to improve uh, even before amalgamation with uh, the Department of Agriculture. I have to put on record to my, uh, I suppose, delight at the fact that environment has warranted its place in the name of the new department. Uh, I think that's very important as well. Uh, just uh, this week, I, or last week, sorry, I had the inaugural meeting of my new part, er, pro <laughs> prosperity uh, panel, which indeed includes members of the very important agri-food industry. We have a lot more similarities with the Republic of Ireland in terms of the input of agriculture, not just to our economy, but also to our environment and our emissions. Therefore, it's vital that we do work closely with that sector. In that, in that respect, we're much more similar to the Republic of Ireland than we are to England, Scotland and Wales, and I believe we should be looking at them, learning lessons from them, uh, not just with what they are doing right, but also what they could be doing better. I call Colm Eastwood. Please. The planning application for the redevelopment of the Brandywell Stadium and showgrounds was submitted on the 12th of September 2014. The proposal comprises the demolition of existing terraces and stand along Lonemore Road and its replacement with a new 2400-seated stand. The development also provides for relocation of the existing dog track within the site. My officials have met with the agent to progress the application, however, some further details are required in relation to a number of issues, including contamination, <coughs> drainage, and boundary details. A consultation response is also pending from the Environmental Health Department of Derry City Council. Thank the Minister for, for his answer uh, thus far. I'm glad to hear that it's progressing. Can he uh, give us any idea of uh, when it will actually be finalised and when we can move to finally seeing a long overdue uh, redevelopment of the Brandywell Stadium. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank Mr. Eastwood uh, for that question. I know the Brandywell is dear to his own heart, as it is uh, to mine, as we're both regular attenders. And I'm sure he'll, he'll join with me in congratulating Derry City to a winning start to their season against Galway on Friday night. My officials are fully engaged and committed to pursuing this scheme to a positive conclusion. Meetings and discussions have already taken place as to the information required to bring the application forward as an approval. It is expected that once the necessary information to address the issues raised by Transport NI and NIEA has been submitted and the objectors, there are a couple of objectors, have been notified and had the opportunity to comment if so desired, the application can then proceed. Given the transfer of planning powers to councils, on the 1st of April, just a couple of weeks away now, most applications will be considered and finalised by councils. However, in this instance, as the applicant is a council, and many such applications and instances will arise over the coming months and years, indeed, careful consideration will have to be given as to how such applications are processed, addressing any issues such as potential perceived conflicts of interest. I call Gordon Dunn. Number four, thank you. 
The European Waste Framework Directive requires Member States to separately collect at least paper, glass, plastics and metal by uh, the 1st of January this year. This directive was transposed into law here in 2011. When the Department was transposing the directive, it consulted with councils in writing and held stakeholder events and bilateral meetings with councils and the three waste management groups. My officials have also had regular discussions with the waste management groups regarding the development and implementation of the food waste regulations, which were made last month. The regulations require councils to provide receptacles for separate collection of food waste from householders. Councils may continue to provide commingled collections of food and other bio-waste where they are satisfied that the amount of food waste collected is not substantially reduced. The issue of the separate collection of food waste from householders have been discussed as part of the formal consultation process in 2013 and subsequently at meetings of the Waste Programme Board, which I chair, and the Waste Coordination Group, which involves officials from my department and the three waste management groups. My officials have also had specific discussions on the issue with the Swamp Group, the Shadow for Mana and Oma Council, and with ARC 21. The provisions of the new food waste regulations relating to householders come into effect on the 1st of April 2017. I anticipate that these discussions with waste management groups and councils will continue to ensure the appropriate implementation of the regulations by that date. To help councils to increase their levels of recycling, my department has provided funding to councils and the waste management groups from the Rethink Waste Fund. The fund covers the capital costs of improving or extending their existing waste collection reuse and recycling infrastructure to meet their EU targets. Over the past four years, capital grants totalling in excess of £12.4 million have been made available to councils under this grant scheme. I call Gordon Dunn for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers today. Does the Minister recognise, though, that ARC 21 has waste responsibility for 300,000-odd householders? This equates to approximately 54 per cent of the Northern Ireland population. And they do presently have a co-mingled waste system for garden and food waste. And does the, the Minister recognise the, the proposed impact of his changes on ratepayers within the new council areas? And I think what is important is we get assurance that consultation on the, these issues will continue. I think we've had a question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank uh, Mr Dunn for that supplementary question. Without a doubt, there will be an initial impact on ratepayers, as I've said, through the Rethink uh, Waste Fund. I have been able to mitigate against many, if not most, of those costs to date through the funding of new receptacles, new vehicles and so forth uh, to, to councils. However, over a period of time, there will actually be savings to councils as a result of uh, these type of arrangements. It's anticipated that over the, the, the next 10 years there will be savings in excess of 12 million, and I would be, I, I suppose, safe enough to assume that those savings will be passed on to the ratepayers. I call Leslie Cree. Much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and um, thank the Minister for his reply. Minister, uh, have you had any discussions with the, your colleague in Detty about the uh, effect that these regulations will have on food businesses generally? Uh, working right through to the rest of us you know, who like to eat in places like that, uh, and if, in fact, any high-level consideration has been made of combined heat and power biomass applications for that? I thank the, the member for that question. And, uh, while I have not had direct uh, contact with uh, Minister Foster on these issues, our officials are in regular contact on these and other matters. I believe, and, and you quite rightly point out, opportunities that can be created uh, for businesses by an initiative such as this, whereas it has historically been perceived that any environmental regulation is perhaps a threat to economic development. I think we're moving more onto a, a, a platform where we can see the economy and the environment working together rather than being at loggerheads. Uh, work has been done with businesses and continues to be uh, through my department and our sponsorship of programmes such as the Arena Network and Business in the Community, which deal directly with businesses, showing them not just the regulations to which they have to adhere, 
a deer, but how they can turn these obligations into opportunities. I call Dominic Bradley. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer. Could I ask the Minister what discussions there have been between uh, councils and his departments about waste food. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Goes by him. We as a her Aaron Tussle, O'Brien for Hania and Kesht. Shen, I'd like to thank the member for that question. Also, my department engaged with councils and waste management groups on the general issue of placing restrictions on the landfilling of food waste through an initial consultation in 2010. Following this. There were opportunities to discuss aspects of the food waste restriction in greater detail during the development of the revised waste management strategy and the complementary development of revised waste management plans by waste management groups in 2013. My department consulted on the proposed food waste regulations between September and December of that year. There were 44 responses to the consultation, including 20 from local government. A stakeholder event held on the 15th of November 2013 attracted over 100 delegates, including many from local government. There were also further discussions on separate food collections with officials from the waste management groups at meetings of the waste coordination group held last year and at specific meetings, as alluded to in my initial answer, with the Shadow, Fermanagh and Oma Council in July last year, also with the waste management groups, namely Swamp and ARC 21 in August last year. I call John McCarthy. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, I'm grateful to the Minister for his replies. Does the Minister agree with me that Bambridge District Council, who uh, had went on a monthly bin trial, had shown a 35% uh, increase in recyclables, a 35% decrease in the amount going into to black bins, a 120% increase over the Christmas Can the member put the question, please? I'm um, grateful, Deputy Speaker. That's a shining example of a policy that was working. Does he ensure my regret that the Council have now backed away from that? Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank Mr uh, McAllister for his question. I obviously regret anything that could be seen as a retrograde uh, step by any Council in terms of meeting their uh, obligations or failing to fulfil their obligations and meeting their recycling targets. I do, and I am aware of the great work that had been ongoing in the Banbridge area. However, different councils and different council areas have different approaches to dealing uh, with waste. And uh, I think as councils now are merging, and we'll see more of this after the 1st of April, they're trying to bring together different schemes from different areas. It's vitally important that I, as Minister, and my department support councils to do so and ensure that the schemes that they do eventually decide on are ones that yield the type of results uh, that Mr McAllister outlined. I call Tom Elliott. Uh, <coughs> question number five, Deputy Speaker. It is unfortunate that these draft regulations were not approved by the Assembly when they were debated on the 24th of February. They would have ensured that the protections for the interests of minority communities in council decision-making, supported by this Assembly when it passed the Local Government Act in Northern Ireland 2014, were enshrined in statutory provision. In particular, the draft regulations made provision that a decision that had been called in on the grounds of disproportionate adverse impact would have to be taken by a qualified majority. As a result of the regulations not being approved, there is no statutory basis for the process for reconsidering a decision beyond that specified in the Local Government Act 2014. The absence of prescribed provisions in relation to the administrative arrangements for the call-in process and the specification of those decisions that must be taken by a qualified majority will mean that each council can determine its own arrangements. As a result, the key policy objective of ensuring a consistent approach to governance arrangements across all the councils is not guaranteed. 
My officials are currently examining the options to provide a legislative basis for ensuring that the necessary provisions are included in Council standing orders on a consistent basis across all the new councils. I will advise the Assembly of the outcome of this examination and how the matter will be progressed at the earliest opportunity. In the interim, my officials are also examining the approaches that may be available to provide a framework for councils which reminds them of the specific requirements of the 2014 Act in relation to matters that must be provided for in standing orders. I call Tom Elliott for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and <coughs> thank the Minister for that uh, answer. Just wondering if, if the Minister is aware if there may be any uh, legal implications for either his department or councils by the non implementation of, of this regulation? Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank uh, Ms. Mr. Elliott for that question. As of yet, no, no such implications have been brought uh, to my attention. However, I fear that if there is a continued failure to adopt and approve, if not those regulations that I had brought forward in their exact form, but something very similar, doing what I had set out to do and what the Department had set out to do and what this Assembly had agreed to do, in passing the 2014 Act, then I do fear that there could be ramifications and they could manifest in a legal challenge of some description. I call Alex Atwood. Thank you. And, uh, uh, well, it's noting what you say, Minister, in terms of what your own department officials are doing. We're three weeks today to the new council that's going live. Is it not the, the case that there's going to be a free-for-all in many councils around, the North, around Northern Ireland, given the failure of these regulations to pass and given uh, the reckless conduct of the DUP in that regard? I think the member has asked the question. Thank you. Uh, thank the member for the question. And the free-for-all that the member mm -hmm. describes is something that not only did I fear, but that everyone in this chamber uh, should fear, and I'm sure that everyone outside of this chamber across the north, all the citizens of the north, will fear. Uh, they do, do not want local government to be in what should be an exciting new era for local government when local government and new councils have been empowered to make more decisions, to make more changes, to make more impact on the citizens within their council areas' lives, that their councils are from the outset blighted by petty arguments, by uh, things being called in that shouldn't be called in, uh, by a complete lack of progress in that regard. It's in that regard, when my officials continue to work on this and, and, and will engage with other parties, as I rely on this to ensure that we do get something through in, in regulation, that we're going to have to rely on leadership from local government, from locally uh, elected councillors. And I hope that they are able to show more leadership than many in this House often are. Or do. Moving on, I call Michaela Boyle. Margaret, uh, Kestia Verche, question six. The DOE is aware of the European Commission's fitness check into the birds and habitats directives. This is the latest part of the programme, which is designed to determine the effectiveness of the directives in terms of implementation and outputs. I understand the Commission appointed consultants in late December last year to develop an evidence-based questionnaire for all member states to complete. The UK and nine other member states have been selected for greater in-depth follow-up action in relation to the programme. This action is to gain more detailed information on implementing the directives. DEFRA is leading on the UK response, with all three devolved administrations feeding into the process. The DOE, as lead Northern Ireland competent authority under the directives, has engaged with the process and has provided input to DEFRA. The initial response is due with the consultants by mid-March. It is intended by the consultants to have a 12-week public consultation of the findings in April, starting in April. In addition to DEFRA, etc., detailed responses will be sought from those specific bodies with experience of the directives. Those bodies include the Department of Energy and Climate Change, the National Farmers Union and the Seabed User and Developer Group. RSPB is coordinating the NGO response through Environment Link. 
It is the intention of the Commission to get potentially differing views on the effectiveness of the directives from a number of perspectives. DEFRA and the devolved administrations are putting forward factual evidence based on scientific evidence and data, much of which has been shared previously with the Commission as part of our reporting obligations under the directives. In addition, links to respective planning policy documents, biodiversity strategies, etc., are being highlighted for the consultants to consider. Following consultation, it is likely that follow-up action with the consultants will be required during the second half of this year. It is intended that the overall exercise will be completed with a final report published by March 2016. While it is the intention of REFIT to reduce the bureaucracy associated with EU laws, it is difficult to determine what, if any, legislative changes will result from the exercise at this stage. Nicole Michaela Boyle. Margaret, can I thank the Minister for his very detailed response to the question. Um, can I further ask, Minister, what impact, if any, will the recent budget have on implementing these possible changes? Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I uh, thank Ms Boyle uh, for the question and suppl supplementary. It is inevitable that uh, the most recent budget that was passed by the Executive and subsequently assembly will have an impact on many areas, if not most areas of service across all departments. My department is no different. In fact, the cut administered to, to my department's budget was greater in percentage terms than to any other department. However, that will not dilute my determination or my officials' enthusiasm to ensure that we do everything continue to work as hard as we have been doing in terms of uh, meeting these uh, targets that are set down to us from Europe, very strict ones they are too, and it is important that we do so in partnership with NGOs and so forth, those with great authority and knowledge of these matters. I call Kieran McCarthy. De Deputy Speaker, uh, what is the Minister doing to ensure the upcoming mid-term review of the 2020 biodiversity strategy provides a strong opportunity to strengthen rather than dilute the Birds and Habitat Directive? Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank Mr M McCarty for that question. I think it is important that uh, the, the review is as wide as possible and participation in the review is as wide as, as possible, with certainly, in my opinion, an intention of strengthening uh, the directive and strengthening the protections that we do already have in place, and which, as I dare say, are it's regularly brought to my attention, are not quite strong enough. I, I see a review as an opportunity to improve, and I look forward to participating in it. I, it won't be in a ministerial capacity, I'm sure at that stage, but I do think it is extremely important and, and that we get as much input as possible and as good an outcome as possible. I call Sean Rogers. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Minister, in an earlier response you mentioned the NGOs. Can I ask you specifically how are the environmental NGOs being uh, involved in this process? Well, uh, the NGO sector is extremely important, again, to, to, to many areas of life here in the North. and certainly. The environmental NGO sector is, not, is extremely important, I believe, in the work that we do. It is important that we work in partnership with them. We will not always agree on everything. The environmental NGO sector here is understandably extremely keen to be involved in providing input to the Commission. To that end, Northern Ireland Environment Link will be coordinating responses from local NGOs, and these responses will be fed through to NIEL's parent organisation, Environment Link. As I said, the NGOs here are extremely keen, some cases too keen, perhaps, uh, to participate. But as I've said, I, I welcome any participation in this. I call John Dallet. Question okay, so number seven. Burning tyres generates toxic fumes and byproducts, which can be extremely dangerous to both humans and animals. I am fully committed to working with and supporting local councils in reducing and ultimately eliminating the burning of tyres on bonfires. Whilst the legal position in relation to bonfires is complex and the relevant powers are exercised by a number of public bodies, including the Northern Ireland Environment Agency and local councils, 
I want to ensure that the environment is protected. Whilst I have directed NIEA to seek to prevent the illegal dumping of tyres and to work with local councils to help progressively reduce the number of tyres being burnt in bonfires, this is not enough. Let me be clear though, where NIEA obtains evidence pertaining to the identity of the producer or transporter of controlled waste allowing or transporting tyres to be burnt on a bonfire, investigations will be carried out. Any enforcement action will be taken against the producer or transporter of the waste, not the landowner. Whilst the NIEA does not have powers to remove waste itself from the bonfire sites, it can issue an Article 27 notice to the landowner directing them to dispose of the waste in a specified manner. However, in most cases, this would result in one public body taking legal action against another public body, and this is clearly in no one's interest. A complex problem needs all of us to show a willingness to develop a resolution to the problem. To that end, I will be hosting a used tyre bonfire forum early next month, where I will be inviting all local councils in the north with a role to play in helping deliver a solution to this intricate dilemma. As that is the end of the period of time allotted for listed questions, we are unable to take supplementary questions. And we move on now to topical questions. And I call Paula Bradley. And um, I realise in my question the Minister might not have this information to hand, but can I ask the Minister for his assessment of the current waiting time for the renewal of taxi uh, driver licences? Uh, I, I thank the member for the question, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And uh, while I don't have the information to hand as to, to the exact waiting time currently, I have been contacted, I say, over a number of months by a number of, shall we say, irate taxi drivers around the wait that they have had uh, for their license. I stood in this assembly a, a couple of months ago outlining the importance of the taxi industry to Northern Ireland. And I think it's very important that we do all we can to facilitate uh, drivers who are the drivers of that industry. They're the, the, the people who get people to work every morning, who make transport possible for those who might not be able to make it from A to B. That's why I was keen to get the regulations through as regards single tier taxing, which the member's party blocked. However, I think it's vitally important, sorry I digress there, that we do ensure that they do not have to wait an undue length of time for their licences and they're allowed to get about uh, their business in an expedient fashion. I call Paula Bradley for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for his answer? And I, like himself, have had in my office also taxi drivers who have come in who have applied for licences and have now been left in debt because of, of the department. So can I just ask the, the ministers what measures can he put in place to speed up the process or even to compensate uh, those taxi drivers who apply in plenty of time and through delays in the apartment or, or department are left unable to work? Uh, thank uh, the member for that supplementary question. Well, it would be loath to get into the realm of compensation here on, on, on the floor of the assembly. I have spoken to my officials about the need to expedite this process and will do so again because it's just last week I got a, a, another call from a, a constituent myself on this uh, very issue. I think it's, it's vitally important, as I said, that these people are in a very difficult industry where fares, I know in my own constituency, have been the same for some 10 or 15 years while all other prices have increased, although there's a slight drop in the price of, of diesel. Currently, and I will endeavour to ensure that these cases are dealt with quickly. I would say to the member, and indeed any member in this House, if there are specific cases, please do feel free to lift the phone or come to my office and we will deal with them on a case by case basis. However, I know that is that's by no means a satisfactory to the, uh, approach to this. It will get the outcome that that person desires, uh, although you will not catch everyone affected in doing so. Moving on, I call William Humphrey. Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister <coughs> if he has made any progress on seeking an amicable solution around the union flag being placed on the driving licence? Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I, I, I thank the member for his question. I thought the solution that we had reached was a fairly amicable one in that there should not be a flag on the licence due to the division that that 
will cause and would cause here in the north. For too long, uh, flags have been used here as, as tools by, by, by some and as, 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 as targets by others. And I think while we debated the issue in, in the Assembly here, and what was a very good debate, a very frank debate, it might not always have been amicable, which is, is the, the term that the, the member uses. Uh, I think I outlined quite clearly on that day and in subsequent and previous uh, media interviews that uh, the decision had been made and that the decision was here to stay. I know uh, one of the members' party colleagues had outlined what what his party would do when they got this ministry, but as this ministry won't exactly exist any longer after this mandate, that will remain to be seen. Call Mr. Minister for his answer, and I, I think he has already indicated there was no amicable solution reached in the day, and certainly we didn't on these benches see it as being amicable, the flag being excluded from the licence, which should be an opt-in. Can I ask the Minister, has he arranged a meeting with the Transport Minister, who I understand has written to him, the National Transport Minister, to take this matter forward and, and seek a meeting with him? Has he arranged that meeting? Has he been in contact? Uh, thank the member for that supplementary. Uh, to date, that meeting has not uh, been arranged. He referred there to an opt-in option. That's an option that I would certainly be happy to explore. However, due to the costs of, of that option, it hadn't actually been presented as an option, I think, as I coined it in, in, in the chamber, I think, in answering a question from Ms. Overy, and it was the option option was not an option. If that becomes an option, then it's an option I will consider. I call Stuart Dixon. Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, Minister, you expect one third of your staff to uh, leave through the voluntary exit scheme. Can you give the House today a cast iron guarantee that you will be able to make this budget commitment in your department's budget? I, I, I thank uh, the member for the question. Obviously, uh, I outlined in response to an earlier question the impact of budget cuts on all departments and the fact I can never resist saying that my department has been hit harder than any other. In order for my department to continue service as it has done up until this point, we would require somewhere in the region of 500 people to leave their posts. I have stated publicly, I have stated here in fact, that there will be no compulsory redundancies in, in, in my department. I know the voluntary exit scheme opened uh, recently. To, to date, I've heard of some interest in that from within my own department and wider interest across other departments. I think it's vitally important what we do do is concentrate on delivering that same level of service, ensuring uh, the protection of our, and promotion of our environment, albeit with what will inevitably be a reduced workforce. It remains to be seen as to whether that will be reduced by the requisite number. I call Stuart Dixon for supplementary. To thank the Minister for, for his answer. But Minister, since you haven't been able or willing to give that cast iron guarantee, what, what contingency will you be able to make in your incredibly optimistic budget plans? Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm not sure if uh, Mr Dixon has looked at, the, at my budget plans, but if he has, he be just about the only person I've heard describe them as optimistic. <laughs> that, that, that's for sure. We have not budgeted on the fact of, 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 of anyone leaving the department. Uh, you cannot budget on the assumption that people will leave. So the figure that we have set aside for salaries is what the figure for salaries was this year. If and when people do leave throughout the year, and it will also depend on when they leave throughout the year, Money will become available, which will be able to go into the functions that I've earlier outlined. I call Alistair MacDonald. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister explain why Kelly Sellers, an important historical building in Belfast, has been proposed for delisting? Uh, thank Mr or Dr MacDonald for that uh, question. The NIEA has been undertaking a review of the historic buildings of the North since 1997. This second survey provides detailed information and records. Its aim is to help improve the protection of our historic listed buildings and over the last three years this work has been underway in Belfast. 
As part of this process, the Department is consulting on delisting a number of buildings. I have been advised that Kelly Sellers was subjected to the same review as all other listed buildings. Though it, though it has important historical connections, it was found to have changed significantly over the years. Walls have been rebuilt due to bomb damage and internal fittings removed. Its authenticity as a historic building was therefore considered to have reduced. It is clear, however, that there is a widespread public interest in this building and that the majority of comments and articles have expressed a desire to see that the heritage that remains continues to enjoy the protection of listing. I can assure the member that no decision will be taken until all views have been received and will be carefully considered. I call Dr. Alastair Macdonald for supplementary. Does the Minister agree with me that to delist this building would be counterproductive in terms of heritage tourism in Belfast? I thank uh, the member for that supplementary question. And the short answer is yes. I do agree with the member. I am also aware that Belfast City Council is opposed to this, and clearly local views such as these will be very important when uh, decisions are finally taken. The uh, question number five has been withdrawn by the, the member listed. Uh, I now call Stephen Mitry. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister to update the House on the transfer of planning functions to the new council structures? I uh, thank the member uh, for that question. The transfer of planning draws ever closer. In fact, uh, many councils have already had their last planning committee meetings in their old form. And, uh, it is, of course, my hope and everyone here's hope that the new councils will be able to hit the ground running as of the 1st of April with their new uh, planning function. There has been an awful lot of investment of, of both money that had been sanctioned uh, by, by the executive and indeed a huge investment of time in the training of the, the new councils and the, the new councillors with specific attention paid to the, the new function that they will have of planning. It is an area where I remember sitting on, on Derry City Council not that long ago and many of the councillors rubbing their hands at the, at the prospect of getting the planning power. However, I think it is fair to say that I have seen in my own interaction with councillors and councils that with the realisation that with that power is going to come a great responsibility, that there is a wee bit more trepidation about it now. We have done everything we can, in my opinion, as a department to ensure that councillors will not just have the competence to take on and make these new uh, these planning decisions, but they will also have the confidence to do so. It is vitally important that they have the competence and confidence, and therefore they will have the confidence of the public as well. I call Stephen Mitry for supplementary. We are going to thank the Minister for his response. As the Minister responsible for local government, is he content that the amount of, tra of training that has been allocated is sufficient, and going forward, is he confident that it will be successful? I thank the member for that supplementary. As I said, I am confident that, as a department, we have done all that we could have and should have done uh, to date in order to build the competence levels of councillors to deal with this extremely important function. However, I have no doubt that there will be further requirements for continued professional development, uh, if you want to call that. Problems will arise, no doubt, across the councils. Decisions will be made. Sometimes decisions will be unmade due to the uh, failure of this assembly to uh, approve the regulations I brought last week. I fear that some councils will start calling in planning decisions that had been passed. I think that's that's very dangerous. There will, they're not just going to be cut adrift. The department will retain oversight and will retain a close relationship with planners in all the council areas. I anticipate that there will be a lot of hand-holding that will need to be done, but it is important that, that councils are allowed time to make their own decisions, to learn, in some instances, uh, from their own mistakes as well. I call Alex Easton. Yeah, could I ask uh, the Minister what is his department doing through the Northern Ireland Environmental Agency to combat evasive and alien species that are threatening our uh, natural wildlife across Northern Ireland? I thank uh, the, the member for his question. 
My uh, department, through uh, the auspices of the NIEA, remain committed to tackling invasive and alien species, which are many fold and take uh, m many forms. I know uh, at a recent meeting I had uh, with the Partnership Against Wildlife Crime, it was a real education to me as to learning what some of our alien species are and what, what might seem like a harmless deer is actually very detrimental uh, to the ecosystem and, and, and the food supply and food chain of other native or indigenous uh, species. Uh, like I say, we work with partners in the NGO sector to identify the species, to identify the harm that they are doing, and to identify humane ways of dealing with these problems as they arise. And that is the end of our period of questions to the Minister uh, for the Environment.